Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away, pumps it in. 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big 3 NBA Podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Hey everyone, thanks for checking in with us here on the Big 3 NBA Podcast. I'm Kwani Lunas, A. Sherrod Blakely, Gary Washburn, both in hoodies. I'm in a blazer. That's not even relevant, but <laughs> we're back. Game 2 is in the books. The series is tied 1-1. So we'll just recap game two mainly. No, look, fix the hoodie, fix the hoodie. Because people were saying Miami was going home. And obviously that was not, it was too soon to be talking like that, talking crazy at that. So we'll just start with game one, uh, game two, obviously. What did you two take away from that win from Miami at TD Garden at that? They played a better game. I mean, you, you start, I mean, and they, literally had maybe the game of their lives. And, and by that, I mean plural, not singular. Seriously. They made 23 threes, something that Miami, they make, they they could go like weeks and not make that many threes, let alone mm-hmm. make them in one game. So give them credit for knocking down shots. Uh, I thought they were a little bit more active and engaged defensively. And, you know, we'll get into it a little bit later, but Porzingis was who we all have deemed kind of the X factor, was a non-factor in game one. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what he does in game two. And you just look across the board, the Celtics really didn't get much contributions from, you know, their other guys not named Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the Celtics bounce back in game three. Yeah. Um, I just think we all knew what was about to happen here. Right. Um, like, <laughs> Gary, do Miami, you feel Charlie Brown? Do you feel that we got Charlie Brown a little bit? Miami needed to take more threes. They did. And the Celtics seemed like they weren't prepared for it. Like, I thought this was one of Missoula's worst coaching jobs since he's been the Celtics coach in terms of his preparation. The Celtics threw no new wrinkles at Miami, nothing new. They just rolled the guys out there and said, play. And Miami had all these damn adjustments uh, covering Porzingis higher than they did in game one, trapping him. Missing, I'm uh, sorry, switching Yo- Jovic um, to him and not Bam Adebayo. Um, you know, just basically inviting them to attack the rim. And what happened was the Celtics attacked the rim. They cooperated fully and they missed 18 shots in the paint. They committed 13 turnovers. And Miami was hot, but what was disappointing to me was the whole like, well, we, um, you know, there was non-shooters out there that hit shots. No, there weren't. Like, I did my research here. Okay, like, Miami is not a bad three-point shooting Good team. Good research. Good yeah. research. Good research <laughs> uh, alert. Miami is not a bad three-point shooting team. They're 12th in percentage. They're middle of the pack, but they don't take a lot. Okay, so... You invite them to take a lot, and their shooters hit shots. Jovic is a 40% three-point shooter. Duncan Robinson, a 40% three-point shooter. Haywood Highsmith, a 40% three-point shooter. Tyler Hero, a 40% three-point shooter. The only two guys that hit threes that were below average is Caleb Martin, and we know what he can do. You got to spe- you got to give him special treatment. Like, you got to... You got to give him the red carpet service when you're guarding him. Like, you cannot treat him like he's normal ass Caleb Martin. He does not play like that against the Celtics. When are you going to get the hint? And then Jaime Jaquez, who's 32%, which is below average, but he hit three of them and you left them wide open. So the whole plan of, well, they're non shooters is no, they don't have non shooters. You gave their shooters who don't take as many. Opportunities to take a bunch, and they hit them, and they went 23 for 43. And to me, it was coaching. It was lack of preparation. Like, to me, I was, I just thought you wanted to, you wanted to put your foot on their neck, and now you didn't let them into the series. Now you got to go back to Miami tied at one. Game three is almost a must win. You don't want to go down 2-1. And now they've got a, a way to figure out the way. They've got a way to beat you. And then you give Spolster two more days of prepare because he's going to throw more stuff at you. Because 
I mean, the 48 hours between – or 72 hours between the two games, one coach made adjustments, the other coach didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you see – Sherrod, did you see any – did you see anything different that the Celtics did that you were like, oh, that, I did not see that in game one? There was nothing. And, and, okay. and that to me – Did you see any adjustments at halftime when they were 13 for 24 from three? It's one of those nights where it's on. It's like – I asked him a few, like, it's like the Luca factor. Luca, 33% three point shooter. I think in the first half against the Celtics, one of them had, had like six. Like, don't you think you need to guard Luca differently? It's his night. Sometimes it just be your night. Sometimes it just, it just be your night. You're a, you, you go bowling, you're a 90 average. That one night, you hit 180. Yeah. Right? Some Someday you night. you're not good at pool, but that one night you're knocking them all in. Like it's sometimes it's your freaking night, and it was the Heat's night. And the Celtics at halftime should have said, you know what? Enough of this letting them shoot threes. How about we defend the three harder, make them drivers, and then that'll open up the game for us. Nope. Let's keep let them shoot. And what did Caleb Martin do? Five or six, like. To me, it was like they were not prepared. They did not make any adjustments, not from game one to game two. They didn't throw one wrinkle at Miami. That, like, come on. This is the, what you all are supposed to be. This is what the, the playoffs, right? This is it. And y'all are coming in, well, you know, the shooters got hot. And, you know, we got, we got cool. game two. At home. At, at the house. Yeah, we're going to be a better home team. We're not going to give up home court like y'all just did. Sorry. Like, I'm just, the whole thing was just, it was arrogance. We got yeah. enough talent. We're going to beat you. We don't care who you got out there. We're good. We don't need to make no adjustments. You need to adjust to us, and we'll still beat you. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the false narrative that I think they bought into was right before the half when they went on that little surge and it, they took the lead. And I think they felt at that point that, okay, we haven't played our best game, but we're just going to roll out what we did in the first half and just do it a little bit better because we are, we're up by three. And the problem with that is it was fool's goal that they were rolling with down the stretch. I mean, basically Miami had pretty much three or four minutes, the entire game where they just didn't, bring it at both ends of the floor. And the Celtics wisely took advantage of that near the end of the second quarter, took us very slim lead. And you're thinking, okay, maybe they figured this out, but they hadn't. And the the thing that I keep coming back to something Joe Mazzula said earlier this year, like as we got near the end of the season where he was asked about just the playoffs around the corner. And he kind of said that basically the playoffs and the regular season, there really isn't a great difference between the two, which I thought was weird because we know damn well there's a huge difference. It's like basically, you know, you're playing, you know, uh, tiddlywinks the regular season, and you playing like grown ass man poker and 21, and 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 the games where stuff matters. The stakes are so much higher uh, in the in the playoffs. I mean, it's like taking a test, you know, 25 question test in the regular season, and a 25 question test for your final exam. That's going to be worth more. You may get the same score, but guess what? That that one that you took, that final exam, that's going to be worth more. It's going to have more value. And I, I don't understand why they're not treating this as if it's the playoffs. You're supposed mm -hmm. to, I mean, you, you should have come out pissed at halftime that you letting these busters roll up in your crib, put their feet up on your table, and have a good old time. And you barely got ahead by three points. At that point, my thinking was that, they're either going to blow the heat out right here and just come out and just just put the smack down on, or they're going to let them hang around and wind up losing this damn game. And I, I'm just shocked. And, and you know, we'll, we'll talk more about Porzingis because he was a problem on so many levels. But, Gary, the guy that you alluded to, Jovic, damn near had a triple-double. I mean, he's their fifth option, and he damn near had a triple-double. Uh, and that's not factoring what he did defensively. You know, against just let him uh, shoot. He's a 40%. Like the whole thing was Joe saying that most of their threes were highly or moderately or highly con uh, contested. We all know that didn't happen. 
Then, then Jalen and Drew saying, well, their non-shooters got high. What non-shooters are you talking about? Hawkins? You know okay. Caleb yeah. Martin? Like, do you really wanted him to show he could beat you again? Like, what more do you need to know? What more do you need him for him to prove to you? That you need to defend him differently somehow. It is a personal thing. It's not me, it's you. You know, like, it is the Celtics. Something brings something out of him. This is one of those crazy sports things where some dude against one particular team goes nuts. We yeah, all we know... It, we call that the Ish Smith syndrome. Yes, Ish Smith. <laughs> that boy never Terrence, had a game Terrence he Ross. Like, he's on the list. We mm -hmm. all know they're just dudes when they play the Celtics, it is on for them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's Caleb. So I'm not saying you turn around and double him, but you don't let him shoot. You know, you don't... And after what happened last year, did y'all learn your lesson? That's what I, it's just one of those things. Miami played well. Spo made great adjustments. And the Celtics responded with nothing besides, we got the talent to beat y'all regardless. Arrogance. And to, like you said, Sharai, Sh Sh like, it's just at halftime, I was like, you said, like, okay, they're up three. So, like, the first possession, they got to stop. And then they turned it over, and then Jovic hit an open three, and it's tied. And I'm like, yeah, like they had a chance to get a lot of little 6 7 0 run to begin the half, get up by 9 10, and then start to maybe, you know, they was going to have to fight them off. This was not going to be a pull away. They weren't going to win by 20. But when they turned it, got a stop, turned it over, I think Drew tried to throw some bounce pass. I forget, but it was a, one of those careless turnovers they made. And then Jovic hits a uh, three from the right corner. And it was like, like Bain stopped hitting threes, guys. Like, when do you get it? They were 13 for 24 in the first half, 10 for 19 in the second. Like, they just did it again. That's arrogance. That's just like letting the, letting the, pen, open up the Pandora's box. And to say that they don't have, they have, like, if you look at the percentages of their shooters, they have shooters. Hey, with Highsmith, I don't know if I ever heard of him or whatever, but the dude's a 40% three-point shooter. He can shoot. So with Jovich, so is, uh, obviously, we know Duncan Robinson. We know Hero and Caleb Martin. Like, that, the Caleb Martin thing just kills me. Like, what, what more do you want the dude to do? Kwani, you tell me. Like, what? how many times do we have to go through this and before they say, Okay, maybe we should guard him differently. Like, maybe game three, they'll get it. Like, I don't know. Maybe game six. Right, but actually, like, well, what more? It's just well, something one about time, shame you. on you, right? It's something about you. He mm -hmm. likes. Mm -hmm. This is Sharad Blakely with the Big Three NBA Podcast, and I wanted to talk to you about Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than three million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports teams and players compete. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in now on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Yes, just four picks can multiply your money big time. You can turn that $10 investment into a $1,000 win with basketball, hockey, and other sports entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. As a longtime fantasy league player myself, Prize Picks is the perfect what's next to satisfy my fantasy league itch. You want into? Here's what you have to do. First, you gotta go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right, prizepicks.com slash CLNS. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. So, that being said, you get a chance to pick more, you can pick less, it's that easy. To your point, though, like you said, all five heat starters scoring in double figures, Miami making those franchise record 23 points, 
I'm going to swap our topics real quickly. We're going to get into Porzingis and the lack thereof of Chris Stapps. But let's talk a little bit more about the Joe Mazzula eric Spolstra matchup. To your point, the adjustments were not there. What is the confidence level with you guys when it comes to the coaching? Uh, obviously, if there were no adjustments in game two, how does Missoula make sure that game three is not this disaster? What you got, Gary? I just think if you you hope that someone pulls Joe aside and Charles Lee, Cassell, Van Gundy, and they come up with a, okay, this can't happen again kind of plan. Like, they cannot lose game three because then if you lose game three, then you're talking about a long-ass series. You're talking about barely getting out of here if you do. You're talking all the doubt comes in. Spo, the, the Heat feel good. They can go up 3-1 if they win game four. All that, and you're like you're seeing the end of this journey really quick. So game three got to be different. And it can't be, well, we just need to switch a little bit more and like – Joe, to me, was too cool. Like, you know, I'm sure he was not happy, but it was not. It was just sort of like, yeah, you know, we'll we'll adjust. You'll adjust. You should have done this best, best game. Yeah. What do you mean you'll adjust? It's not from game to game. It's from quarter to quarter, half to half. If some guys aren't getting it done, we can talk about, like, the whole thing. We can talk about Porzingis was a minus 32. That's like, it might not be his night. It might Chris Stapps come on to the bench. Al or Xavier Tim, somebody. Chris that it was you put a dude back in the game in the fourth quarter, and I think then he was like a minus 29. It is not his night. It just ain't his night. Quit forcing it. And so Spolstra, sorry, Missoula, one, is getting lapped again. Two, he's got to figure out some adjustments for game three. And he has. He he made some adjustments in the Philadelphia series last year. He made some adjustments in the Miami series last year that got him back to 3-3. But he's got to do it now. Like, I just didn't understand. Everybody knew Miami was going to shoot a lot of threes. They said it to the media. You got to shoot a lot more threes in order to compete in the series. So you just let him shoot them? And then, they well, they just got hot. Like, no. This isn't a mid seat This isn't a February game against... Orlando, like you can't give up playoff games like that. They're too precious. So Missoula's got to go back to the lab, and hopefully he has some help and some people coming into his office and saying, Joe, we got to do some, I got a plan here. This is what he got this new coaching staff for, because we all know Spolstra is going to come up with something different in game three. We all know they're not going to run the same game plan. They're not. So now Joe's two steps behind. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's inexcusable. There's got to be more accountability here, and he's got to he's got to prove his chops. You thought you was gonna get by in this series with straight talent. A lot of people did, and now you're figuring out. Okay, I'm gonna have to really coach this series because the rest of the coaches, if they win, Cleveland, JD Bickerstaff, he's a nice coach, but he ain't spo. This is you. You facing the best coach in the league with an average roster. Who can make his? Who can? I mean, he he is. Uh, I don't know. Quan, he might know the designers, the people. You see the YouTube where they take the the average looking people, yeah. men and women, and they make them into look like, supermodels and oh super, yeah, yeah, like and it's a like, whoa <laughs> transformation you know? Tuesday. Yeah, transformation. That's Spolstra. <laughs> he, he, if he was a if he was a, if he was a designer, he'd be a, a billionaire because he could just make he makes water into wine. That's true. That's true. Like he, you know, you go in there looking scraggly. He have you going looking like looking like Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> oh my gosh, stop! I can't. <laughs> oh my goodness, so like like Michael B. Every time, or Michael, or Michael A. Or Michael, you know, the real Michael Jordan. Um, so, so you good. know, then have you out there looking like Idris? So you you're already two steps behind. Mm -hmm. The the goal of Missoula is to make catch up. And the players got to help him. His coaching staff's got to help him because he just seems stubborn enough to where he's going to, his lack of adjustments are going to make this in a real series. Mm. 
Yeah, and that's a problem. That's a problem because it, it, it has a residual effect over the course of the postseason where you find yourself in series that maybe should go five, maybe six games, all of a sudden have to go seven. Uh, and and you, you have to treat these moments as precious opportunities and not just something that's going to just happen. Uh, I don't think they're valuing the, the opportunity that they have in, in, in this postseason series. Certainly they didn't in game two. And Joe, to his credit, he's done a better job from where he was a year ago to where he's at now. But that doesn't mean he's doing a great job. That doesn't mean he is one of the top two, three coaches. I think he's had a good year and certainly should be in that. If you're talking about the top five, six mm -hmm. coaching jobs this year, Joe Mazzula is should be in that mix. But that means absolutely nothing in this moment. It's what are you doing to put your team in the best position to move on to the next round? And to your point, Gary, I mean, it, it felt as though they, they went into this series thinking that we're just going to out-talent them to get to the next round. That no matter what Jedi mind tricks that, you know, uh, Spolster will play, we're still going to be a better team. We're still going to find a way to emerge victorious. And it didn't happen in game two. And if they're not careful, they're going to get clipped in game three. Uh, and this is where someone on this team, and I think it's going to be Jalen Brown, someone needs to just be super-duper in-line to in-line impact uh, mm -hmm. someone who's going to force Miami to do some things they maybe weren't planning to do or force them to get out of some sets so that they're looking to run because they got to address this this dude who's killing them uh, at both ends of the floor uh, everything came too easy for Miami in, in game two they got to their spots they got wide open looks uh, they weren't really pushed or prodded or forced to be any semblance of, of uncomfortable and you have to do your due diligence to make teams feel uncomfortable in the playoffs. If teams are feeling good about themselves, that means that you're probably getting your ass kicked by them because they're feeling good about themselves. They're not just going to feel good about themselves just for the sake of feeling good. <laughs> Joe Missoula has to figure this out. This is, to me, his crossroads movement. Uh, you've got a team that is built to win a championship. You're playing a team that's built to barely get into the playoffs. What the hell are we doing playing in a game five? What, why is this happening? Uh, Joe has to be better. Bottom line, Joe has to be better. Well said. We are going to move on and talk about Porzingis a little bit more. Six points on one of nine shooting. What was going on? What's going on with Porzingis? Well, game two. That's all I got. <laughs> Can't even ask the question because I'm just. Um, I think that they blitzed him. Um, the Celtics did not make a lot of good entry passes. He had he had butterfingers on some of those passes. He got frustrated by missing some layups. He took some rush threes and he just wasn't effective. And if you looked at the plus minus, it was bad from the jump. And I think he was like a minus twenty two in the third quarter. Like I just think. Sometimes you have to go into a situation and say, okay, this might not be your night. And it wasn't his night. And they forced him out there and he ended up being a minus 32. Like that's like in 30 minutes with Porzingis on the floor, Miami outscored themselves by 32 points. And they lost by 11. So if you do your math, in the other 18 minutes he wasn't on the floor, the Celtics outscored the Heat by 11. Right? 22, yeah, 21. 32, whatever. Um, you carried a two. Hold up. Minus 32, 11 point game. So the Celtics outscored the Heat by 21 points with Porzingis off the floor in those 18 minutes. Hmm. So it was just a him. It might have been a him issue. Right? And, it, and that's the thing. And it's just some nights. That's the playoff basketball. We saw Brandon Ingram sit in the fourth quarter of a game recently. Like sometimes you got to take your best guys and be like, it ain't you tonight. And you can get pissed at me. You, you can come talk to me when we ran after the championship parade. You want to, you, you want, you want to get mad at me about it. Wait till, because if we win this game without you, it was the right move. And I think the stubbornness of Joe, it might've been best to just finish the game with Horford. Because obviously Horford was more effective and you just have to sometimes figure some things out on the fly. And, it, and it's not a, a situation where 
you know, you bench Porzingis for the, you know, for the future, or you, you know, yeah. he'll be better in game three, mm-hmm. but for game two, it was not his night. Horford in his 23 minutes was a plus eight. Like, like if one of your centers is a minus 32 and the other one is a plus eight, what do you think you should do? Uh, one in. Facts. Like, that's it. It was just not a good night. I mean, Jalen was a minus 22. I get it. And Derek was a minus 23. Jason was a plus six. I don't know how that happens. But in the in the minutes, it's crazy the plus minus thing sometimes. Mm-hmm. When it was obviously when Jalen was playing on the floor without Jason, the heat was winning. <laughs> when it was Jason, it was it was leveled off. So to me, I just think he'll be fine. I think they'll make some adjustments to him getting the ball in the post. He'll hit more shots. He's not going to go one for nine, zero for four from three. Um, but he's but Joe again needs to react and be more instinctive. You know, what did Spo do with Kevin Love? Do played six minutes. Yep. Like Kevin, not, not your night. You you'll be out there next time. He was a minus seven in his six minutes. And Spo said, yep, the same for you tonight. Right. I'm playing yep. more Haywood Highsmith. I'm playing more DeLon Wright. You know, I'm playing more. I'm going to stick with my guys. I'm going to stick with out of bio for 40 minutes. Um, that's what I'm going to do. Mm. Mm. Overall, we'll, we'll play a game of pick and roll right now to wrap it up. Good Heat or bad Celtics? Which one do you think? Was the case in this series? Yeah, game I thought two. it was bad Celtics. Um, I, I again, kind of just really hammering home what we've been talking about. They just didn't play with a sense of urgency. A team that has had the kind of year they have had should mm-hmm. have. You need to go into that game looking at the Miami Heat as a mosquito, and you got a sledgehammer. You could easily swat them away with a fly swatter, but you're trying to crush them fools, <laughs> and that just never that didn't happen. Uh, and that to me, uh it gives you reason to pause about whether this is this team is who you thought they were, whether this team has the mental toughness to fight through, you know, boring, uh, excuse me, boredom. And some of the things that when you have as much of a cushion in the entire NBA as they had in terms of their record and the second best record, you, it's not surprising that you have some semblance of a letdown, but the great ones can fight through that. The great ones come into this game and yeah, they may have hung with you for a half, but the second half, we're going to make some adjustments and changes, and that's we're going to put it, we're going to kibosh that real quick. Never happened, never happened, and I, I'm I am a little surprised to be honest with you, because I mean you knew that of all the matchups that you could have potentially had in the first round, if there's one matchup where your coaching is going to be a factor, and you know this, this is it. Mm-hmm. You can get away with being a so-so coach in in the series and still win in pretty much every matchup except this one. Because here you're you're dealing with you're dealing with the grandmaster uh, when it comes to NBA coaching. He's extremely talented. Uh, Spolstrom is extremely successful. He's shown the ability to win with lots of different types of players, different types of egos. Uh, he's someone that you can't take for granted, and he's shown his track record is come playoff time, he's one of the best at drawing up plays, at making sure plays are executed, and all that stuff. So. It's it's disappointing that the Celtics did not recognize the moment that was before them. Um, so hopefully they can get back on track uh, down in Miami, and then they can take back control of the series. Gary, yeah, good Celtics. I mean, good Heat or bad Celtics? Yeah, bad Celtics. I mean, I, I you know the Heat were good, but they were allowed to be good defensively. They were good. Yeah, the, the, but offensively just letting them take threes and not contesting and letting guys who can get hot, get hot. Yes. Like to me, that was inexcusable. So bad Celtics, bad game plan, bad approach. Um, And like Sherrod said, I think the key, like Sherrod said, was at halftime. You're up three. Jalen had to go on that barrage at the end of the first half to put you up three. So you come in in them half with all the momentum, right? Um, you're feeling like, okay, three or four possessions here, take care of the ball, score, 
we can go up eight, nine, 10, then we can start, you know, then they'll start pressing a little bit, but you turn the ball over, allow it three, and then suddenly it's a tug of war again. And you, cause you messed around with the game because some of those turnovers were, were bad trying to throw really tight bounce passes into double coverage and, and just, you know, Tatum, oh, I'm going to flick this, you know, lead pass to Porzingis. And it, like, no, that's – you do that do that against Charlotte in, in, in March. Don't do that here. Take care of the damn ball. And out of the, what, I think the 13, the 13 turnovers, how many, did, how many points did Miami score? Let me look here. 20 points for hood research. 20 points. 20 points, yeah. And out of the 14 turnovers they committed, the Celtics scored nine. And how much they lose by? 10. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, like all those little things, and Joe talks about, about the margins, they made a difference. The little things, the extra bad turnovers, allowing points off turnovers, um, you know, missing 18 shots in the paint. Like, you know, that, that's not a good average. They scored 46 in the paint, but they missed 18 shots in the paint. And when you're not hitting threes and taking threes, because Miami ran you off the line and invited you to go into the paint, you got to be more efficient from two. So bad Celtics. So one more thing for me, I love the playoffs, obviously because of the game we watch on the floor. But also the pettiness on social media. I actually am dropping this in our chat, just in case you two didn't see this, but I'm sure you have. Jimmy Butler not playing on the floor, but very active throughout the playoffs already. Jalen Brown last year had said, don't let us get one when the Celtics were down 3-0. Jimmy Butler photoshops himself onto the graphic and posts it. Caption saying, felt cute. Might delete later. Psych, I ain't deleting bleep. So Jimmy Butler, his role, what do you think his role has been? Again, we haven't been able to talk to him as much or really interact, but seeing his social media engagement, how do you think that plays a role in not only Miami's performance, but just in general when you think about the rivalry that has become Boston versus Miami? Well, Jimmy can't impact the game with his play, obviously. Sure. So the next best thing is impact the mental game of your opponents. And mm. and that's, you know, that that's Jimmy. That's He's, he's really smart and savvy to, to do that. Uh, but it's not going to factor into to how this plays out. Um, you can talk all you want about what they can do and this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, uh, it's going to become a game about the talent and ability of the players. And even though you, you certainly, you know, you have to admire – you know, the, the stuff that the Heat were able to do in game one, you know that it's not sustainable. Uh, you know that their ability to play in a very, on a very large uh, platform the way. Bottom line is this. Miami has no business winning another game in this series. And the Celtics, they need to play like that. They need to, they need to bring the receipts that shape, that show that you're a good team. You need to bring the receipts that gives people an understanding of why only three teams in Celtics history won more regular season games than you. They need to start doing the things to really build this thing out and stop playing with the food because that's what they're doing. Cut it out. Don't I'm play with my damn food. kids right now, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Gary. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Jimmy is going to take advantage of his opportunity to, to give the Celtics a hard time and it just adds more fuel to Miami's fire. They go home now feeling good. This is exactly what you didn't want. If they go down <clears throat> behind 0-2, they know their season's on the line. They can, you know, like all the teams going home 0-2, you can fake it. Oh, man, we're going to turn the series around. Like, no, you got to win four out of five against a team that spanked you twice. Like, that's hard. The Lakers, the Pelicans, all these teams going home. The Magic, you know, going home down 0-2, they know they got a steep hill to climb. Now you didn't give them hope. And then you're going to go into Miami, six o'clock start on Saturday. So the fans will be there because it's, it's a, you know, hopefully. Uh, they'll you know, get there the eventually. Yeah, yeah they'll get there. It might be a little bit late arriving, but you didn't give them hope. And it's exactly what you didn't want. Now you got to win in a raucous atmosphere to save the series, to like not make sure the series, you don't want it to go to six or seven. 
They might have to. You might have to. You might have to win this in seven. That's where I'm at now. Like, you know, you might have to sit, win, sit this and win this in seven or six. You know, it might not be a five game series. So now you got to step up your game. And, you know, Jimmy, I'm sure he, maybe he'll make an appearance on the bench, get the fans. Like, who knows? But, like, you can't let that get in your head. You got to focus on being better if you're the Celtics, not get caught up in this, like, we better, we better, we, we, we uh oh, we're in trouble here. Like, just go out there and hoop. And like Sherrod said, if you play the way you're supposed to as a Celtics, Miami shouldn't win another game. And don't forget, Gary, you, you want to be better. 2024, Sherrod, be better. Be, be better in game three. We're barely over with the year, but this word, the words continue to resonate with not only us, but the Boston Celtics. Game two in the books, game three back, well, not back, in Miami. Game four, of course, in Miami as well. So it will be interesting to see how Boston and Joe Mazzula specifically bounces back for that game but until then that's a wrap on this week's episode of the big three nba podcast make sure you are subscribed if you haven't done so already because again the playoffs have just gotten started it's getting spicy you're going to want to stick with us gary sherrod they're on the ground running around making sure that we're getting you all the information you need so you want to stick with us for a sherrod blakely and gary washburn i'm Kwani lunas big three nba podcast we appreciate you listening and we will be back very soon be better <laughs> be better be better